Boa noite. Ele é referência mundial na música sinfônica. Costuma jun juntar ação política a seus concertos e lota os auditórios por onde passa com sua orquestra. Apaixonado pela música vienense, mas com um repertório muito vasto, que vai de bar aos compositores eruditos do século XX, é um nome de peso na regência contemporânea. O Roda Viva entrevista esta noite o maestro indiano Zubin Mehta, regente da Filarmônica de Israel, uma das mais importantes orquestras do mundo. Zubin Mehta trocou o bisturi pela batuta. Aos 17 anos, em Bombaí, sua terra natal na Índia, pensava em ser médico e chegou a iniciar os estudos. Mas era filho de um violonista e maestro e a influência paterna foi inevitável. Nascido e criado num ambiente musical, tomou outro rumo na vida ao decidir estudar música na lendária Academia de Viena. Sete anos depois, começava a carreira de regente, que o levaria a conduzir as mais importantes orquestras do mundo, a começar pela de Viena. Nos anos 60 e 70, foi diretor musical da Sinfônica de Montreal, Filarmônica de Los Angeles, e em 78, chegou à Filarmônica de Nova York, onde atuou como maestro durante 13 anos. Nesse período, Zubin Mehta também ocupou o cargo de conselheiro musical da Orquestra Filarmônica de Israel, da qual tornou-se diretor musical em 77 e diretor musical vitalício a partir de 1981. Considerado um dos melhores intérpretes da grande literatura sinfônica, ele ajudou a dar a marca de excelência e de flexibilidade de repertório, hoje ostentada pela Filarmônica de Israel. Para entrevistar o maestro Zubim Meta, nós convidamos o maestro João Carlos Martins, Enio Skeff, crítico musical, Norma Cury, repórter do Jornal do Brasil e correspondente da revista Visão de Portugal, Salomão Schwartzman, apresentador dos programas Diário da Manhã e Sábado Perfeito, os dois na Rádio Cultura FM, o maestro Walter Lorenzão, Vicente Adorno, editor internacional da TV Cultura e o maestro Júlio Medalha. Nós também temos a participação do cartunista Paulo Caruso, registrando em seus desenhos os momentos e os flagrantes do programa. O Roda Viva, você sabe, é transmitido em rede nacional de televisão para todo o Brasil. Hoje, por se tratar de um programa gravado, ele não permite a participação dos telespectadores com suas perguntas. Mas você pode mandar críticas e sugestões para o programa pelo nosso endereço na internet, que é rodaviva.tvcultura.com.br. Boa noite, maestro. Queria começar com o seguinte. O senhor é, tem essa atividade há 40 anos, não é isso? As pessoas, em geral, costumam achar que atividades como a de um maestro, ou de um pintor, ou de um grande músico, é, não tem rotina, não tem a repetição constante das coisas. E eu queria saber se isso é verdade. Se, é, 40 anos depois, é como se o senhor estivesse começando, tal como a gente imagina aqui da planície, ou se, no fundo, os, esse tempo todo de prática da regência constrói uma rotina. Thank God I don't know what the word routine means. Thank God I have an orchestra like the Israel Philharmonic who don't allow me to be routine. Even if sometimes we are conducting a program, for instance in Israel, for the eighth or ninth time, and I find I'm relaxing or my mind is going, I feel at once that the musicians call me back. I said, help us. Don't let us go, don't let us down. Uh, it is a constant, perpetual motion of give and take. And of course the music that I conduct, thank God I love with all my heart. And therefore uh, I have no choice but to be present every moment that I am on the stage. E o fato da música ser, digamos assim, das apresentações de orquestras, do porte de uma fila harmônica ou de uma sinfônica, serem momentos é, assim, especiais, é, sobrevive num mundo tão eletrônico quanto o que a gente vive hoje em dia, em que tudo é gravado e tudo transmitido simultaneamente de um lado para o outro do planeta, via internet ou via televisão? Quer dizer, existe ainda, esta, é uma pergunta antiga, obviamente, espaço para essa situação insólita, que são pessoas ouvindo instrumentistas... Tocarem uma música, às vezes, que tem 300 anos, sentados num espaço comum? Well, thank God we still have an active concert life everywhere. 
Some places like England and America are going through crisis of public. But where I live now in Munich, Florence, Tel Aviv, there is no public crisis at all. We have full audiences every night and the advantage of making music for people behind you, this can't be compared of course to recordings. Of course we make recordings ourselves too, so we are defeating our purpose sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is nothing, for me there is nothing like a live performance. Uh, Maestro, I would like to ask you if it is possible, with uh, an orchestra philharmonic in Israel, not to mix uh, art and politics. Se é possível uh, a música ficar acima do que se passa naquela região? E se há alguns compositores banidos? Well, we have a very particular situation in Israel. There is not one member of the orchestra that has not been touched by what goes on in the country. Either the musician himself is part of an army unit or his children are, one is in Gaza, one is in the Golan Heights. So everybody is touched by this every single day. Sometimes we play a concert, thank God now at the moment there is a relative calm. But last year I was playing a concert in the main auditorium in Tel Aviv and we heard these huge ambulance uh, sirens and a cafe was blown up five minutes from our concert hall. Uh, Forty people were killed, you know. And But we live with this situation. I think it is going down now. I think with this new uh, venture of the Israeli government in Gaza, maybe uh, internally there is great argument in Israel. But at least between Jews and Arabs, inshallah, they will be a little bit quiet. I'm not talking of pieces yet. Yeah. First, we need quiet. E, e há algum compositor banido? Por exemplo, é, eu sei que é, é, o senhor gosta muito do Strauss e do Wagner. É, o senhor toca normalmente esses compositores ou há algum problema? Eu só queria juntar o seguinte. Que eu conversei com o maestro há uns anos atrás e lhe perguntei exatamente isso, há uns anos atrás nós conversamos e a questão que ele coloquei foi exatamente essa da, da, de um interdito não escrito quanto à execução de Richard Wagner especialmente e a ligação do Richard Wagner com a questão do antissemitismo e tudo isso. Se Wagner, enfim, está sendo tocado em Israel, eu acho que é isso que a Norma queria perguntar, e quando se deu isso, se é que se deu? O Barenboim... Well, I understand. Ms. Cooney's question very well. Uh, we don't play Wagner at the moment. We do play Richard Strauss since 10 years without any problems. Until 94, we didn't play uh, Richard Strauss either because of his personal con contacts with, uh, with the Nazi party, etc. Although he was never a Nazi and his works were always performed, uh, Richard Strauss never collaborated with a Nazi librettist, never wrote, even to the end of his days, any Germanic opera uh, in the last years. But Wagner we are still not playing because there are too many people still with numbers on their arms in Israel. Those people are considered holy. They are the last real heroes. And we, we don't want to insult them. And I tried once to play Wagner in 1981 because I felt being the only democracy in the Middle East, we should also be able to play. Uh, so uh, I, theoretically I was right, but I did not consider the feelings of these people to whom Wagner, that they heard in the concentration camps, that they, it would bring them back. You know, if they drive a Mercedes-Benz, it doesn't bring them back so much as music. Music transports in a different way, in an emotional situation, and we have to have patience. Uh... Eu gostaria de perguntar ao maestro, aquele concerto da Filarmônica de Israel e a Filarmônica de Berlim, juntas num único concerto, quando o senhor também regeu, como foi a, aquele relacionamento entre os músicos e dos músicos em relação à cidade e ao país? 
well, the relationship was wonderful. First of all, we have been playing in Germany since 1971. That's the first time we went. There was a little bit of a trauma then. Should we go, should we not go? And from 115 musicians, only two preferred to stay at home. Uh, the rest, we play. We opened the Berlin Festival in 1971. Our soloists were Daniel Barenboim and uh, Fischer Diskau, one Israeli and one German soloist. And at the end of the concert where we played Mahler's first symphony, when we played the Hatikva as an encore, the whole public stood up and there were a lot of people with tears in their eyes. As what I was describing before, what music does to people. Uh, and since then, there has been no problem. And uh, in the 90s, as you mentioned, the Berlin Philharmonic came to Israel and we did a symbolic concert together where the musicians sat in different, you know, white and black uh, costumes so that we can make out uh, who is who. And they just played like they were brothers. Uh, musicians are like that. We have we the played tape here. <laughs> Beethoven Fifth Symphony, and it's like they played all their lives together. Of course, it helps that I know both orchestras also. Yeah. If I didn't know one of the orchestras, I might not be as comfortable. I just wanted to, in the sequence of the Norma, the Skeff, do dizer que essa semana ocorreu em São Paulo um fenômeno musical mais raro que, o, que a passagem do cometa Halley. Zubin Mehta e Daniel Barenboim regendo um dia depois do outro. É, eu sei da sua ligação com Barenboim, com a Jacqueline Dupré. Aliás, há um vídeo interessante onde o Sona aparece lá tá no, no quinteto a truta de Schubert. Eu estou tocando o contrabaixo. Coisa é. extraordinária. Mas, de repente, tem a orquestra de árabes, de palestinos e judeus tocando anteontem na Sala São Paulo aqui. Como é que o senhor vê, do, do ponto de vista musical, do ponto de vista político, como é que isso analisa essa orquestra formada por judeus e palestinos? Se os judeus e os germans podem jogar juntos, e eles têm uma história muito mais religiosa, Jews and Palestinians can play together also, uh, or Jews and Arabs, uh, there is no problem. My one dream is to take the Israel Philharmonic to Cairo and to Amman and Damascus and God knows one day to Baghdad also. In fact, I have an invitation from Baghdad to conduct their chamber orchestra and I really want to go, but my wife is completely <laughs> against it. Um, what Daniel Barenboim is doing is a wonderful thing. And although I know that during the recess hours, because these, these kids, they live together in the training period, they have lots of arguments, etc. but they sit together and they play under one stick, of course, of authority, and that makes them play music, and I'm sure the concert was wonderful. You know that with regard to Wagner, os judeus pensam nisso também, Woody Allen, que toda vez que se ouve Wagner, se tem vontade de invadir a Polônia. Por que não? Os germans invadiram a Polônia. Não acho que Israel quer invadir a Polônia. Não, não, não. Não. Não dê mais problemas para os israelis. Eles têm que primeiro ir para Gaza na próxima semana. Na próxima semana. O senhor está fazendo um trabalho muito interessante com essa aproximação de músicos de Israel e músicos palestinos e de outros do, alemães também. E o senhor tem uma história muito longa com o Estado de Israel. Como é que foi que o senhor foi para lá e se decidiu a trabalhar lá? Parece uma história muito interessante. Well, it was a pure coincidence. I was in Vienna uh, without any work and I uh, was with my family. Uh, I had just, you know, uh, absorbed my uh, diploma. I was one year in Liverpool as assistant, and I was sitting there without any, uh, not too many concerts. And I get this telegram to say, please, uh, we would like to invite you. And the telegram was signed Pal Phil Ork. So I didn't even know which orchestra it was, because it was 1961. They still didn't change their uh, telegraphic address. There was still Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra <laughs> in the address. So I asked, what is it? And they said, it's Israel Philharmonic. Of course, I was free. And the, because the famous conductor, Eugene Ormandy, was sick. 
and they needed somebody. And in Israel, we always invite people to give at least 15 concerts. So to find somebody last minute to conduct 15 concerts with the rehearsals, it's not easy, except somebody who has nothing to do. So I went, and it was really a, a love at first sight. Nos, We então, immediately clicked musically. Mas, além, além dessa feliz coincidência, o que, que o senhor sentiu dos músicos israelenses que fez o senhor tomar assim, um amor tão, assim, tão evidente por esse trabalho? Well, first of all, I had left Bombay, where I was born, I think, yes, yeah, seven years ago, before that. And I was only in Vienna, and a few times in England, to visit my parents. But the minute I landed in Tel Aviv, and I saw the complete confusion, which is the part of the uh, people's character there, uh, I mean, street confusion, I felt like I was at home. <laughs> I thought I was in Bombay again. So I, I felt, even before the first rehearsal, I felt wonderful. Uh, there. I remember it was with Daniel Barenboim's parents. We went walking on Dizengoff Street and I said, this is the, like home. And the next morning was the rehearsal and immediately after the intermission of the rehearsal, when I came back, the orchestra was applauding, which was a surprise for me. Uh, they immediately sort of uh, recognized that we were having a common language. So and, uh, I conducted my 13 concerts. É. And they immediately invited me again. Uh, Esse amor à primeira vista está durando até hoje. Yeah, yeah, it was. Well, I remember after the concert there was a reception and the concert master of the orchestra who was the head because it's a cooperative orchestra. He said that the, uh, Mr. Meta and the orchestra are of the same age because I'm also born in 1936 and Toscanini <laughs> conducted the first concert in 1936. And since we are the same age, I'm sure we will celebrate our 50th anniversary together. Hmm. In other words, he was already inviting me for 25 <laughs> years. And this is what happened. Oh, Maestro, when I did the inauguration of Glenwood Memorial in Toronto, I ended up establishing a good relation com Emir Gilles e com Yud Menuhin. E um mês depois, em Londres, num jantar com Menuhin e com Gilles, ele, o Gilles falou que talvez pela sua qualidade como contrabaixista, e na opinião dele, ninguém acompanhava um solista como você. A clareza para acompanhar um solista. E o Menor, aí eles falaram que você é conhecido pelo grande repertório romântico, mas que no fundo o seu fraseado é um dos mais elegantes para o repertório de Mozart e para o barroco que muitas pessoas em outros países não são familiarizados. Qual é a sua relação hoje com o barroco e com... Eu sei que você está regendo aqui é Mozart. Então, eles falaram que era um dos fraseados mais elegantes, era o seu no classicismo e no barroco. Como é que hoje está a sua relação com o barroco? Bar, tem... Aham. Uh -huh. Well, I tell you what, I grew up in Vienna. Uh -huh. Vienna was never, in my times, a specialized Bach city. Yes. Vienna had its repertoire from Haydn to Schoenberg. Uh -huh. This is what my great love is. And so I would never really went into the world of Bach as much as I went from the Haydn masses to the Mozart masses and of course the symphonies, etc. I wish Mr. Gillels would have told me himself all those wonderful things. <laughs> But, uh, But we had a very good relationship. É, e há uma, mais uma pergunta. Você acha que a música está ajudando Israel com a Palestina? Você acha que a música pode ter esse mesmo efeito na relação Índia-Paquistão? <laughs> India e Paquistão are quite close today, not because of music, but cricket. <laughs> In fact, when India is Pakist playing Pakistan cricket, I am glued to the television, and that's the only time I'm for India, of course. But when Pakistan plays against England, I'm for Pakistan. Because we are the same people. I believe we are one people. 
I never believed the British should have divided our countries. We speak almost the same language. We speak, we eat almost the same food. And so uh, Pakistanis are friends to me. And um, there is a great musical contact also. The ghazals, the songs of the north, are sung by both peoples. Uh, Indian films are very popular in, uh, in Pakistan. Pakistan. As a matter of fact, recently, a Pakistani actress was kissing an Indian actor, and it's a scandal in Pakistan because some of the religious people, uh, they don't want to see her anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll tell you what, between Israelis and, and Palestinians also, we are trying our best to bring it together also with music. We have an ensemble in our orchestra where musicians of the Israel Philharmonic and Israeli Arabs, people, you know, who are Israelis, they play music together, they go on tours, they recently toured America, they played in Carnegie Hall. And so that's something healthy. It's starting on a small scale. Uh, two weeks ago in Israel, I played the Beethoven Ninth Symphony in a kibbutz where there were 3,000 Israelis and 400 Arabs. And the 400 Arabs bought tickets for that concert. We didn't give free. Free was to the Arab children who came, 100 Arab children. So we had 500 Israeli Arabs, and uh, they wanted even more tickets, but it was sold out by then. We didn't think that so many would buy tickets. So uh, we will do it again next year. Maestro, please. Maestro, I had the pleasure to hear you for the first time in a concert in 74 in Los Angeles. Mas o tempo passou, acompanhei sua longa carreira e lembro-me ainda da deferência da amizade que o maestro Nazar de Carvalho dedicava à sua pessoa, pela sua competência, pelo seu repertório e pelo senhor como pessoa também, que ele admirava muito, com muito afeto. E, uh, mas eu quero lhe fazer uma pergunta que não é técnica. O senhor mencionou de passagem sua esposa, eh, o Adorno mencionou o amor, pela, amor à primeira vista pela Orquestra de Israel. Eu queria lhe perguntar, em nome de nossas telespectadoras, eh, se a mulher tem um papel importante na sua vida e na sua carreira, desde sua mãe até sua esposa. Bem, well, of course. Uh, my wife has been a great influence in my life. To bring me down to earth sometimes when. <laughs> when they see all these butterflies around me after a concert. Uh, my wife is a very solid person. Um, and so was my mother. My mother supported my father in his career. My father died when he was 94, and he conducted his last concert when he was 92. And my mother was always with him, in India, in England, then in Los Angeles. My father conducted a youth orchestra for 35 years uh, and she was you know she knew exactly what happened at every rehearsal because my father would tell her everything and she would advise him and she would phone the students and ask why didn't you come to the rehearsal and my husband is very angry because he wants you to come to the next rehearsal etc and uh, my wife doesn't involve herself that much in my life because it's much more on a professional basis I don't need that kind of help at home, but uh, she's always on tour with me, and uh, she's a great support in every way. And she plans the vacations, oh. <laughs> which is very important. Before my wife was, a, I had no vacation, because my vacation, in a way, is on stage also. In fact, sometimes my wife plans vacations that are so strenuous that when I come back to the concert stage. I'm finally like sitting on a beach. <risos> <risos> Maestro, nós temos uma pergunta de Oswaldinho da Cuica, gravada em VT. Vamos ver. Alô, Maestro. Primeiro, é uma honra muito grande ter essa oportunidade. E segundo, dizer que hoje é um dia de festa para o meu coração. Quero fazer uma pergunta rápida, dois em um. Primeiro, pela sua grande experiência pela a dança no universo da música, se vai ter chance, oportunidade do senhor conhecer o ritmo regional do Brasil, que é um dos mais ricos do mundo. E segundo, agora quero prestar a minha homenagem para esse balé magnífico de Israel.
O senhor teve a oportunidade de conhecer Thank a música you. brasileira? Brasil means yes, yeah, sure, all my life. But what he was playing is used sometimes in the orchestra in a different sound. It's called the lion's roar. Edgar Varese uses this yeah, instrument see. also. A Orquestra Filarmônica de Israel foi fundada em Tel Aviv em 1936 e desde seu início reuniu grandes instrumentistas. A maioria vinha de orquestras alemãs e do leste europeu, de onde foram expulsos na fase de ascensão do nazismo. Emigraram para a Palestina convidados por um violinista judeu-polonês que assim formou a chamada Orquestra Palestina. Com a independência de Israel em 1948, a Orquestra Palestina passou a ser denominada Orquestra Filarmônica de Israel e rapidamente transformou-se numa das melhores do mundo e numa das mais importantes instituições culturais israelenses. Maestro, durante anos o senhor fez uma, uma atividade que eu não consigo imaginar como era possível. Reger duas orquestras, uma em Nova York e outra em Israel. Eu li em algum lugar que o senhor se dividia quatro meses por ano em cada uma, mas imagino que não eram quatro meses seguidos. Como é que era a sua rotina nessa época? Well, I usually spend about six weeks with each uh, ensemble. Today, I'm the head of three. <laughs> ah, melhorou então. <laughs> yes. Munich Opera is five months, with the Israel Philharmonic about two and a half months, and then one month on tour. So I'm with the Israel Philharmonic for three and a half months, and Florence. Maggio Fiorentino, e estou lá por dois meses por ano. E aí, nos intervalos, o senhor deixa um assistente em cada uma dessas eh, localidades? Não, quando eu não estou lá, há guest conductores que, você sabe, nós tentamos obter os melhores conductores possíveis para cada uh, orquestra. Mas a, a, eu, eu não, entendo, não entendo de música, obviamente. A sensação que eu tenho, que é algo parecido, que eu consigo entender, é algo como um, um cozinheiro de um grande restaurante, se é que não é grosseira a imagem, no sentido de que é, se um, utilizam muitos ingredientes diferentes, no caso de uma orquestra, pessoas com todas as suas complicações. Como é que alguém que passa seis semanas ou oito semanas é, e dá o seu tempero, consegue fazer com que isso volte a acontecer novamente dali a algum tempo? Well, it's a very good question, actually. If the guest conductors are not of a high level when I'm away, when I come back, I do find the orchestra not on a lower level, but Sim. certain anarchy <laughs> steps in. You know, people are doing what they want. There's not a musical discipline. And, but it takes a few rehearsals to get it back. But if the guest conductors are of the ones I respect, then I come and find the orchestra playing as, as well as ever. And that happens especially in the Opera House in Munich, uh, because they have many conductors. <laughs> because in Munich we have performances every night. From September 15th to June 15th, except for Christmas or <coughs> one or two days in the season, every single night there's a performance. So it's very, orchestra has to have great responsibility to keep up the standard. Uh -huh. Maestro. Pronto. <risos> yeah. uh, o senhor está rodeado por especialistas e críticos de música erudita. Qual é a sua relação com os críticos e com a crítica? Well, basically I try to have no relationship. That there is no influence either from my part or from their part. Uh, sometimes when they want to come to a rehearsal, they are most welcome. And I, sometimes I'm surprised when I'm doing new music that the critic doesn't want to come to a rehearsal. Um, because sometimes the music is so complicated that even if I would hear it the first time, I wouldn't know what to say. So I don't know how they come only in one performance and can write a detailed analysis of this piece. Uh, so I wonder that way. Otherwise, uh, um, basically it's better not to have uh, a, a friendly a personal relationship. It's not, it's not healthy. Mas o senhor gosta das críticas? So, em geral? I read them. Uh, if I, if I learn something from it, uh, wrong or right, I, I respect it. Um, I, I have basically no complaints uh, at this moment of my life. 
When I was in New York, I, w I had a bad time with them. But of course, I didn't know them personally okay. even then. <laughs> Mas por que a bad time? I don't know really because I never spoke to them. <laughs> uh, some, some people would tell me that, you see, New York has only one newspaper, basically, that is respected, especially with the, with the artistic sense. And uh, they have four or five gentlemen who are writing. And one was trying to show the other how badly he could write about me. <laughs> you wrote something bad about me? Wait till next week. I'll show you. Somebody told me that in my own organization. But of, of course, I didn't influence them. And I didn't uh, try to uh, get to know them or anything. In Europe, I'm treated very fairly. If they like something they, and they don't, uh, it's fine. Israel, same thing. Go ahead. Mas é, não leve em conta os críticos, porque nenhum crítico ainda mereceu uma estátua. Não é assim tão importante. Mas eu tenho observado as suas mãos desde que o programa começou, as suas mãos. E me lembro que há 15 dias atrás, Curto Mazur é, regiu a Filarmônica de São Paulo sem usar a batuta. Ele regiu com as mãos. Ele pergunta se a batuta é um instrumento de domínio perfeitamente dispensável. I personally cannot conduct without a baton because it's an extension of my hand and I am a Wagner conductor, basically. I conduct the ring operas and I can't imagine conducting Goethe Demeron without a stick. I would be paralyzed at the end of the um, performance. You know, the first act is two hours <laughs> only. Uh, I'm, next month I'm going on a tour of Japan with the Bayerische Staatsoper with the Bavarian Opera, and we do Tannhäuser one night and Meister Singer the next night. So the stick does a lot of work for me. It's the it's the wrist that works, many times. Many times you use both hands. You know, there's no there's no law about it. There's no uh, tactic. But uh, a lot of times the orchestra is also happy when the conductor is quiet and lets them play. <laughs> A propósito de regência e de batuta, é, eu gostaria que o senhor falasse um pouco sobre a sua experiência em Viena com os professores que esteve lá, e já que os centro europeus têm uma mente um pouco mais organizada, que construíram a, a técnica de regência, qual foi a sua experiência de estudo lá e se o, e se o senhor hoje está é, transferindo toda a sua experiência a uma nova geração, e se existe uma nova geração, o senhor gosta de dar aulas, por exemplo? Well, of course, there is a new generation with a lot of talent around um, and there always will be uh, you know conducting is a mystical profession it is so easy superficially seen and yet there are so few really great conductors you cannot answer that question either my time in Vienna was indispensable for me and my uh, teacher Hans Swarovski gave me the discipline which I carry till today tonight I will conduct Mozart's Jupiter Symphony with the same discipline that I learned from him. And after the intermission is a Mahler Symphony, which has the same form as the Jupiter, only extended. So there is no real difference. And this you learn in Vienna, how to draw the clean circle. Then you can be variable, you can, uh, you know, dance around, but still the basic technique, the basic clarity, because the orchestra musician is the one who is making music. He must feel quiet inside, and the conductor gives him the quiet that he can perform, he can interpret, and he can rely on the man in front of him to guide him when it's necessary. And this I learned in Vienna. Sure, the hours. No. No, I don't Não mind if, if students outros. come to the rehearsal, ask me questions, etc. It's okay. But I have no time for that. Maestro, há uns anos atrás eu perguntei ao Eliasar de Carvalho, ao Maestro Eliasar de Carvalho, uh, sobre algumas músicas que, o, que me encantavam em determinado momento. O senhor é um intérprete. O senhor, há 40 anos atrás, o senhor tinha alguns compositores que o senhor preferia Houve alteração ao longo desses anos? E se houve, 
Qual o compositor, digamos, que o senhor lá naquele período gostava e que hoje o senhor gosta menos, ou o contrário? Qual, o que o senhor talvez não apreciasse tanto e que hoje lhe parece muito importante? Well, certainly my love for the Viennese school of music has not diminished. My love by that I mean, I said it before, from Haydn until Alban Berg, Weber. Both these schools of music is 80% of my repertoire. Of course, I love to do French music. I do a certain amount of Russian music. I adore Stravinsky, but I don't do as much Shostakovich or Prokofiev. I do it, not as much. I do nearly everything that Stravinsky wrote. So it's my preference. But in building my season, where I'm music director, I encourage my guest conductors then to do more Shostakovich or Prokofiev or uh, Florent Schmidt or English composers that I don't particularly enjoy doing. You know, I love Elgar, but I'm not so keen about Vaughan Williams. But that's a personal, it's not a critique. So if a conductor comes and says, I want to do the Antarctic Symphony of Vaughan Williams, I said, please, be my guest. So the season and the public have to hear a balanced diet through, through the year. So it's my repertoire and my love mixed with what my guest conductors like. O maestro, justamente o maestro Eliezer de Carvalho, me disse na ocasião, eu perguntei, existe algum compositor que o senhor tem que voltar constantemente para como que ter um equilíbrio, para voltar a ter um ânimo novo? E ele me disse sim. E eu disse quem? Ele disse Beethoven. O senhor tem algum compositor que o reanima, digamos assim, com qual o senhor retorna ao seu estado de... de, 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 de de plenitude como intérprete. I must first say, Eliezer was a great friend of mine. I loved him. He was my teacher for a semester at Tanglewood in 1958. He taught me the Chamber Symphony of Schoenberg, one of the great masterpieces of the 20th century. And I carried this with me all my life. And uh, I wanted to play it here the last time we came in 2001 in, in homage to him, but uh, the presenter didn't want it. Uh, I, I miss him because every time I came here, we used to have dinner and he was a wonderful man. Maestro. But uh, about revisiting a composer, with me it happened with Berlioz. I didn't study and learn Berlioz in Vienna. And it was a it was this mountain in the horizon looming that was always for me to climb. And recently I did the Trojans. And uh, it was a discovery for me. Mm -hmm. a, a, a real, a master. A giant that is being neglected. And I must tell you, I spoke before that in Italy we all have full houses. Except when we do Berlioz. Nobody came. The Italians did not trust to hear an opera of six hours <laughs> um, to, to have the patience. So we, we rehearsed for six weeks and we had sometimes three, four hundred people in the audience. It was, a, for me, a blow to me. Maestro, por falar em Itália, eu acho que o senhor está ligado a um acontecimento que talvez tenha sido decisivo até para a indústria do disco no século XX. Eu me refiro ao concerto dos três tenores que foi apresentado nas temas de Caracala em Roma e muita gente até se refere ao senhor o maestro dos três tenores e eu recentemente revi esse concerto e eu fiquei pensando como será que foi possível juntar três monstros sagrados da música lírica do século 20 Pavarotti, Domingo e Carreiras e o senhor conseguiu controlar tudo isso como é lidar com o ego I thought this might be one of those meetings where the three tenors will not be mentioned. Quase. <laughs> <laughs> But I must tell you, first of all, they might have egos when they are separate. Together, they have no egos. They were the best of friends. It was my idea to make a medley so that they would all sing together. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, you're coming all evening, one after the other, But you have, and there is no opera 
with a trio for three tenors. There's yeah. nothing like that. So we asked my friend Lalo Schifrin, the great movie composer, to put together the songs that they chose uh, so that they could sing together on the stage. It was a, a labor of love. You see, the first concert was never meant to be commercial in the sense it became. It was for welcoming Jose Carreras, who was sick for two years with leukemia. leukemia. Mm -hmm. So it was to welcome him back. That was our uh, 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 motive for doing the concert. And since all three of them were going to be before the finale of the world uh, football, yeah. we would all be at the same time in Rome. So we said, let's go and make a concert. That was the only reason. Then it became so popular that it, we did one before the last night of the football in Los Angeles. But that's the only thing I did with them. I only did two concerts. Probably you were there. I don't know if se depois houve alguma coisa parecida, a maior audiência ao vivo em toda a história da televisão, porque o concerto foi transmitido para o mundo todo, e alguém já escreveu que se não tivesse sido um acontecimento como esse, a música clássica não teria sido tão revigor, revigorada, e também as vendas de discos voltaram a subir depois desse concerto. O senhor concorda com isso? Bem, well, não foi nossa intenção fazer esse missionário work. <laughs> Uh, it happened that way. I have to tell you uh, that from the first concert and from the 20 million records they sold, the three tenors and I did not get one cent <laughs> because we agreed to do it for free. Uh -huh. We are idiots, but this is how it is. <laughs> for the second concert, we were paid very well. Maestro, I would like to show you a question from a young musicist Brazilian. Let's go. Bom, meu nome é Angela, tenho 16 anos. E eu queria saber qual música que o maestro mais gostou de reger e qual orquestra. Well, that's a difficult question. Uh, you know, I do music that encompasses 400 years. I cannot bear to have favorites. Otherwise, tonight's concert is second class or second best. Uh, thank God I've come to the position now that I can conduct music that I want. Sometimes, of course, we commission composers to write music, and even if it doesn't turn out to be very good, we have to play it. That's the one instance where I don't enjoy what I'm conducting. Otherwise, I must say 90% of the time, I choose the music which I love, and that which I love is that, is that what we are doing this evening. Zubi Meta foi o primeiro regente efetivamente contratado da Filarmônica de Israel, que já veio 11 vezes ao Brasil. Tocou nas principais salas de concerto do país e também se mostrou ao grande público, como nessa apresentação em agosto de 1997, no Parque do Ibirapuera, em São Paulo. Além de turnês internacionais, a orquestra faz todo ano 150 concertos só em Israel e dedica-se também ao ensino e ao desenvolvimento de jovens talentos musicais. O orçamento da Filarmônica de Israel vem da venda de ingressos, de doações e subsídios do governo. Duas fundações trabalham exclusivamente para arrecadar os recursos e, com isso, assegurar a qualidade e o futuro da orquestra. Maestro, o senhor estava falando aqui no intervalo que hoje pela manhã, em, no dia da gravação deste programa, teve uma experiência musical interessante numa favela. Como a gente costuma relacionar a favela só a más notícias no Brasil, eu queria que o senhor contasse para nós. Foi em Heliópolis, aqui em São Paulo, não? Sim, eu estava em Heliópolis, no Instituto Bacarelli. E eu não sabia o que esperar, eu pensei que eu vou para uma favela para ouvir jovens pessoas jogando music uh, what I heard was almost a professional orchestra I see. they played uh, uh, overture by Gomez and then the first moment of the Beethoven fifth symphony and in the middle of the 
movement, I took over and I finished. <laughs> and uh, I had a great experience. And before that, young kids came and they sang. Uh, they were excellently trained. And to think that 500 children from the favela have a different future if they want it. Because now it will depend on each one if they practice and if they go forward. It's very important for the parents to give these children all the opportunities. In fact, there was one bass player, I don't even know his name. He played a little piece alone for me, a complete virtuoso. That boy could join tomorrow the New York Philharmonic. He is so good. Uh, and I, I had an experience that I feel everybody should help them. And already they are going to build a new, a new uh, school yeah. for them. Um, and uh, I don't know, many private uh, sectors are taking part, and I, I salute them. I wish something would, uh, like this would happen in my country. Timo, Norma Cunha. Uma, em 1970, eu participei de um programa com você, não muito ortodoxo. Mas uh, a NBC depois me falou, um diretor da NBC, que você teve uma audiência incrível nesse programa, foi um sábado de noite pela televisão americana. Você não se lembra? Eu lembro, of obviamente, que você played uh, part of the Renascera Piano Concerto. Yes. And it was the first time, and I think last time on commercial American television, that classical music and pop were mixed for one hour without a commercial. Yes. There were no commercial breaks. We went from one piece to another. And I remember we did the Bach Brandenburg, Sacre du Printemps, all excerpts. Jacqueline Dupré no. was there. No, no not Jacqueline. Pinkas, Pinkas took a man. Pinkas, Pinkas. Yes. And, uh, but then it was the first time Santana was on television. Yes, yeah. Look where he is now, look where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Maestro, uh, nós estamos aqui numa televisão a pública. Eu gostaria de lhe perguntar, naturalmente é outra área, mas pelas suas andanças pelo mundo, talvez o senhor possa ser um ótimo conselheiro para nos dizer como é que uma televisão pública poderia ajudar tanto a revelar novos talentos entre os jovens, o senhor acabou de falar nessa orquestra infantil, né? e ao mesmo tempo também aumentar o público de televisão e de música entre os jovens. O que é que a televisão poderia fazer? Well, television can do a lot. They have to want to do it. Um, American public television broadcasts, you know, classical programs, theater and concert, quite a lot. PBS, you know, I don't know about Brazil, what happens. Uh, and in Europe, they have now this Arte channel, which does very good work. But I don't know if they really have a, a vision to uh, get young talent. This we do ourselves. You know, every time I'm in Israel, I have one session of two or three hours where about 20 talented children play for me. And I take about three or four of them and they perform with the orchestra for young people. We have young people's concerts where usually we have a master of ceremonies explaining music, etc. But in my concert, I have three or four young kids playing as soloists. Not that we want to exploit them, but just to inspire the children in the audience also to want to learn. And then those children playing with me, they are up to about 15 years of age. They go back to school, because I don't want to see them again until a few years later when their teacher tells me, no, now they are more mature, now you can use them in a concert, in a regular. Midori started with me like that, Sarah Chang, Gil Shacham, Shlomo Mins, Yefim Bronfman, they all started with me like this, in young people's concerts. Maestro, uh, o senhor disse que reger é um ato místico. E eu sei que o senhor medita, e eu sei que o senhor tem dois gurus, uh, Zoroastra e Gandhi. E... Well, Zoroastra is my prophet. Uh, I probably belong to one of the smallest religious minorities in the world. Uh, we are descendants from the old Persian religion. Mm -hmm. And because we don't convert, 
like Christians or Muslims, we are becoming less and less in the world, and we are only 80,000. Qual é essa religião? In the whole world, we are 80,000. Uh, Gandhi was, for us, as children, growing up in India, of course, our inspiration. And he should still be. Many people in India think that India is forgetting Gandhi, unfortunately, yes. and the principles that he stood for. Uh, I hope somebody in India will re restart this great thought of this, this man who it was possible for him to ask the British to leave without a bloody revolution. This doesn't exist. Since then, there have been only bloody revolutions. Yes. Maestro, o seu trabalho é bastante variado. O seu trabalho é com concertos, com ópera, etc. Mas eu tenho um, uma admiração muito grande por um trabalho que o senhor fez há muito tempo com a trilha sonora do filme Manhattan, de Woody Allen, em que se juntou a, a Filarmônica de Nova York sob a sua batuta mais o Dick Hyman, pianista e arranjador, e acho que foi um resultado tão maravilhoso, e eu pergunto, por que não repetir isso? Eu gostaria de ver e ouvir mais vezes trabalhos como esse, ou o senhor nunca mais teve chance de fazer? Well, you know, I was 16 years music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, so you can imagine how many times the movie studios asked me to record music for movies. I never did a single one, because that's not my thing. Uh, the Los Angeles Philharmonic is a great symphony orchestra. We don't have to play in the movies to uh, progress ourselves. Uh, some of the mu movie composers were great friends of mine, like I before mentioned Lalo Schifrin. Mm -hmm. uh, I did the one time I went away from this philosophy because I had great admiration for Woody Allen, and he asked me, and when he said that the music would be only Gershwin, I said yes. So I was not be uh, playing a movie composers, you know, with a click track, and uh, I, I, that's not my profession. So I recorded the movie, music straight without looking at the movie, and he put it in later on. Uh, and sometimes he complained that the music was too strong for his scene. I said that's not my problem. Eu acho que até hoje a gravação que o senhor fez da Rhapsody in Blue pro filme Manhattan é uma das melhores que eu conheço com, com o pianista Gary Grafman. E eu tenho a sensação de que o filme não seria o mesmo sem esse tipo de música. Talvez seja uma pena que ninguém mais tenha se lembrado de pedir para o senhor fazer isso. Nem mesmo na Índia, talvez, que ainda tem um, uma indústria de cinema tão poderosa quanto a dos Estados Unidos. Quem sabe o senhor pudesse dar um empurrãozinho para esse tipo de coisa. Não, eu tenho realmente não conexão com os of course, I don't live there, but now they are becoming very popular, especially in England, with the Indian community, in America also. And I'm sure if they were shown here, people would love them. It's the ultimate kitsch. Maestro, o senhor já se referiu várias vezes à função do maestro, quer dizer, como é que o senhor começa a se aproximar de uma peça estabelecendo um paralelo com a arquitetura. O senhor vai para casa, examina a partitura e como que constrói ou tenta entender como que aquela música foi construída. E o que eu queria compreender é como é que é possível fazer isso se na grande maioria das vezes o senhor certamente já tem uma referência sonora, auditiva daquela música. Porque se fosse uma composição inédita, tudo bem, mas em muitos casos são composições que certamente o senhor já escutou ao longo da vida. O senhor desliga o, o ouvido, digamos assim, a memória auditiva? Well, you know, I have my own concept of every piece that I am, first of all, analyzing and then building up so that when I come in front of the orchestra for a rehearsal, I know this piece as well as I can and it is my duty as a conductor then to convince 100 people in front of me to interpret what I think Sim, the composer é. intends. For this, I have to know the composer's language. Now, I'm talking mostly about classical composers, because modern composers are writing very explicitly what Sim, they want. Claro. Já dizem que querem. Yes, there are so many indications that we have less problem with modern composers. With Schubert, who doesn't write anything in his music except piano and forte and diminuendo, we have to know his complete work. 
We have to know his quartets, his uh, chamber music, to cross-reference between a symphony and a quartet. We have to know his songs, to know his whole language. And from this we come to certain understandings of what he wants in that particular symphony. Now, I have a great advantage with the Israel Philharmonic. They are a conglomeration of chamber music ensembles. There are at least in the Israel Philharmonic 10 or 12 professional chamber music bodies that play professionally. That means they rehearse themselves without a conductor, the same Sh the Schubert Quartet. They decided about the tempo, the speed of the music. They decide about the interpretation. So when they play the Schubert Symphony, they are completely at home also in the style. So it's a great advantage for me. So it's not as problematic as you think. Ah, sim. Quais são os grandes maestros que o senhor admira e por quê? Seja deste século ou do início do século XX, os grandes maestros foram modelo e os seus modelos de interpretação ou de regência, de artesanato de regência. Well, without even your finishing the sentence, I can tell you that my two models all my life has been Toscanini and Furtwängler. Toscanini because he was the one who took the classics the, of in the 1920s and before the 1920s, which were in those days always warped, dis, uh, disfigured by other conductors, that he says, I'm going to clean the painting and let you see the real original painting. We cannot be enough grateful to this man for doing that, because he, he was the first one with the courage to say, I am going to play this Beethoven symphony exactly what he wrote on paper, and not add symbols and add different instrumentation like was done before him, including by people like Mahler. We, we have scores in the New York Philharmonic Library, still with Mahler's corrections, and he put in so many uh, additional uh, instrumentation, etc., which we don't think is necessary anymore if we balance the music well. And of course, Furtwängler was the one who respected this cleaning up of the classics, but who said, okay, but we have to read between the notes what the composer really didn't put down. And so the combination of these two thoughts, we are the inheritors of that. And I feel with these two guiding spirits that we didn't, I didn't know them personally. In fact, I had a ticket for a Furtwängler concert in Vienna when I first arrived in 1954, and he died. So I never even saw him once. But the writings of Furtwängler are very important to read, and his concert performance recordings, not commercial, concert performances show so much of this if you listen to Beethoven Ninth Symphony, or the Bruckner Eighth, or the Tristan and Isolde, which is a commercial recording, but beautifully conceived. So these two people are my role models. Then growing up in Vienna, my immediate role model uh, was Karajan, who was the conductor of the Vienna Opera when I was there. And of course, he also was a very strict disciplinarian, musically speaking. So going to his rehearsals, I learned a lot. And then my advantage in Vienna was, of course, going to everybody's rehearsals. There was Joseph Cripps and Karl Böhm, Raphael Kubelik, and my teacher, who was the great theoretician and the disciplinarian. The combination of this, I profit from until today. Eu sou Pedro, tenho 12 anos, toco flauta doce e flauta transversal. É, eu descobri que gostava de música erudita quando eu ganhei um CD de Telemann e fiquei ouvindo ele, até decorar as músicas. E aí eu realmente me interessei pela música. E eu gostaria de saber quando foi que o senhor descobriu que gostava de música erudita e quando resolveu ser maestro? Well, it's a very good question because I don't remember. Because I had music in my home since my birth. Uh, I cannot remember the first time I heard music. 
I can't, it was never a discovery for me. My father played music at home, he practiced, he had a quartet at home, uh, and we played records. Mas ele queria so que o senhor fosse uh, médico. I, I had a brainwashing. Mas ele queria yes. que o senhor fosse médico. Does that make sense? No. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I went to the university for two semesters. Sim. And then I said, that's not for me. E por que? Ele tinha algum tipo de, de, digamos, insatisfação com a sua atividade? No, no. It's a social thing. We are middle class people in Bombay. Middle class people have five professions. Sim. Doctor, engineer, lawyer, architect, banker. Uh -huh. So the parents chose for me the doctor and for my brother, accountant. Sim. <laughs> and my brother became an accountant. Que instrumento seu, seu pai tocava, executava, maestro? My father was a violinist. Violinist. Uh, very good violinist. And then later became a conductor. Conducted in uh, Los Angeles, this American Youth Symphony. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was telling the boys at the favela today. That hundred kids from my father's orchestra in Los Angeles are today playing in big American orchestras. And it's up to them if they practice and if they evolve, they can all go and have professions in, in good orchestras. Mas, em sequência à pergunta do, do Medalha sobre Maestros, há um livro chamado O Mito do Maestro, do Norman Leberest. O senhor falou em Toscanini, ele fala da ditadura de Toscanini. E registra que, que Toscanini só aceitava ser tratado como maestro. Nada de senhor, nada de vossa excelência, mas unicamente, simplesmente de maestro. Essa palavra tem realmente essa força suprema, maestro Zubimeta. Today, every plumber is a maestro. Every carpenter is just not. Uh, no, but this benevolent dictatorship is very important. We cannot be the kind of dictators that Toscanini was because Toscanini didn't have to deal with the unions in his days. It was a little bit easier in those days. Um, today, we start the rehearsal at 10 o'clock and we finish at 12.30. Uh, and if we go 12.35, they get half an hour more pay. You know, so it's economics also. Also, it trains us, the conductors, to be more economical in our rehearsals. Not to talk too much, to come to the problem immediately, because the minute you start a rehearsal, problems exist. And you have to know exactly to go to the cancer and solve it. If you can't solve it at the moment, you have to leave it to the musician to practice and come the next day and be better. So we have to do always practical work and economical work. Plus, we are, of course, rehearsing, let's say, the Eroica of Beethoven. So we are standing before the Mona Lisa, and we have to make the corrections. Uh, and that we must be a little bit of a dictator means we have to exert a discipline. And musical discipline is very important. And you cannot let the musicians go into an anarchic situation. And that's where the conductor and his despotism or his authority comes very important. And the conductor cannot afford to let that authority slip away. Otherwise, unconsciously, the musicians will take over. Take over, in the neg not in the negative sense, But each one will do what he thinks is right. And the combination is never good. Except if one player is playing a solo, then it's fine. Then it's my duty and my pleasure to accompany him. Unless he distorts the music in such a way that I can say, please, I respectfully disagree with you. you know. But I love to give my musicians the freedom of expressing themselves because they are some of the finest musicians in the world sitting before me in Israel or in Vienna or in New York, etc. Each one on his instrument is one of the best in the world. And he has thought about his phrasing, about the way he wants to build his, his four bar or eight bar phrase. And he is very convinced of what he's doing. And sometimes 
he convinces me also that what I wanted may not be the best way. So I said, okay, do it your way. This way, I'm also de very democratic. But with groups of strings where 16 people are playing the same notes, you have to be autocratic. Bravo. So it's a mixture. Maestro, o senhor falou das suas férias e eu gostaria de saber se, porque o senhor uh, toma café da manhã, música, almoça música, janta música, e eu queria saber o que é que o senhor faz depois de tanta música, qual é o seu outro prazer além da música? Pintura, leitura, esporte. do que é que o senhor, esporte, do que é que o senhor gosta de fazer, além do cricket, evidentemente. I love to play with my grandchildren. Unfortunately, I don't see them too often because one lives in Philadelphia and two are in Montreal with my daughter. Uh, I don't see them too often. But uh, now, for instance, after this tour, I have 10 days off. So I will go for two days to Philadelphia and two days to Montreal to visit them. How many? And, yeah, in Philadelphia, one. And Montreal, two. Uh, my daughter has two, my son has one. And then, of course, my Perpetual motion starts again. I go to Vienna, etc., etc. But uh, of course, I like to watch cricket if, if I can. In Brazil, they don't show it. Uh, <laughs> two days ago, there was a very exciting match between England and Australia. I couldn't watch it. Maestro, eu gostaria. O senhor, se não me engano, o senhor é um dos recordistas de público aqui também no Brasil com o concerto que o senhor fez com a Filarmônica de Nova York no. No, no, Ibira, no Ibirapuera. Esse tipo de apresentação ao ar livre assim, é, tem uma certa dificuldade técnica, etc., mas me parece que é uma maneira extremamente prática de chamar uh, novos fãs para a música erudita. Aqui no Brasil, principalmente, o, o, o custo disso é muito caro, o, o ingresso para ir ao teatro é muito caro, acho, acho que é uma iniciativa muito boa. O senhor tem feito mais disso? Eu faço isso constantly, especially during the summer months. We remember Ibirapuera with great, great love. Because I remember one time, I've done about three concerts there. Once it was raining and we had 80,000 people with umbrellas, uh, with New York, with the Israel Philharmonic. One concert we did at the Botafogo Beach in Rio. We played on the beach. Half the public was on the sand, half the public was in the water. It was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> recently, I did a, co a concert. And what is wonderful is these concerts are free. Because we have to build not only our future audience, like our future orchestra comes from the favela. The future public must come from the beach also. It's very important. Uh, in Central Park, we play every year. When I was in the New York Philharmonic, And sometimes, when the concert has fireworks, there are 300,000 people. So it's good to have fireworks if we can get them in, you know? We played Tchaikovsky's 1812, and people love it. Um, we did a free concert recently in Vienna, in front of the Schönbrunn Palace, this beautiful palace outside of Vienna. We had 90,000, and the Vienna Philharmonic also now starting to think that way, not only a Bon Mons concert in the Musikverein. Um, in recently in Munich, I did a free concert. In other words, we do it all the time. And Ma it's very healthy. Maestro, a última pergunta, nosso tempo está acabando. É, a sensação que eu tenho é que a música erudita, a música clássica, teve um grande apogeu no passado. É um engano de quem acompanha pouco a música? Ou isso é fato? Well, If you think of the United States and England, you are right. There is a real crisis of audience, not in New York. Sim, mas eu digo de, de, de criação de compositores. Of the creator of the composer. No, uh, there are many composers. We have to see. The time will tell. You know, recently I did a piece by Luciano Berio, great Italian composer, who wrote this work called Sinfonia. In, in, the, in the early 70s. Today we played like a classical piece. Maybe there are pieces written today that will become classical later on. We don't know. There are, there are a few very good, uh, talented young composers. 
We have to put the music through, you know, a sieve that like you, you pour the coffee. Mm -hmm. And we have to see what's left over. Time will tell. Maestro, muito obrigado pela sua entrevista. Eu queria agradecer aos nossos participantes aqui, e a você que está em casa, e convidá-lo para estar aqui novamente na próxima segunda-feira, sempre às 10h30 da noite, com mais um Roda Viva. Uma ótima semana e até segunda-feira. Thank you.